Show me the money. This is the MoneyWeb Be a Better Investor podcast. Picking the brains of professional investors on their investment strategies, successes, and mistakes. Your host, Rick Fanica. Welcome to this week's edition of the Be a Better Investor podcast. My name is Rijk van Niekerk and in this podcast series I speak to finance and investment professionals about their investment journeys and why they chose a career in managing other people's money. And we also look at the investment decisions they took before they turned pro. The idea is to find a few tips and tricks to assist amateur retail investors to become better investors. My guest today is Fakile Mbokota. She is the CEO of Satrix. She has been in this role for nearly two years. Before joining Satrix, she was an investment manager at the Government Employees Pension Fund. She also had stints at APSA, Momentum Asset Management and Riscura. She has a master's degree in finance and is busy with a PhD in finance and investment. Fakile, thank you so much for your time today. Let's start with that PhD in finance and investments. What is that all about? All right. So I'm doing my PhD. The title of my topic is Private Equity Firm Performance, Governance and Economic Growth in Africa. So I started that PhD program when I was at the GPF at the time. So when I was at the GPF, I was the acting head of investments and actuarial. And I also looked after a portfolio of private equity assets. And there I really, you know, enjoy making a difference and making a positive difference and just finding a gap and helping to find that solution. So the main intent of my PhD is to determine how we can, as Africa, can attract investments on the unlisted side to improve GDP performance and growth. Thing that we have a very young population and there is so much potential for growth and also job creation as well. No, absolutely. You don't see many PhDs in finance and investments, and it sounds really interesting. But let's talk about you. Where did you grow up and what was your dream as a high school learner? What did you dream about of, you know, becoming and uh, what you would like as a career? So I grew up in a township called Klebhat. Klebhat is based in between Northwest and Province. And uh, I spent most of my primary schooling there. I was quite good. I was one of those kids who were always first in class. And my parents decided to take me to a Model C school and thereafter boarding school. I really enjoyed studying, really. What did I dream about? I was uh, one of those confused kids who didn't know what they wanted to do. At some point, I wanted to be a doctor, but I knew that I was be great with blood. Mm-hmm. At some point, I went to be a psychologist, but uh, I knew that wasn't really going to work. But I really enjoyed numbers. And at some point, my principal, who was my accounting teacher at the time, suggested I should do accounting. And uh, I then pursued accounting because I enjoyed numbers as well. So you went the accounting route. And when were you first exposed to investments and the investment world? I was first exposed to the investment world in varsity. I went to Pretoria University where I studied finance and I did my BCom up to my master's. There I got to learn about portfolio model theory and cumulative returns. I must say I learned and I studied to pass, but when it comes to cumulative returns, I think the hands-down experience of actually doing it was the actual teacher for me. Just elaborate a bit on that. I think that from a cumulative return perspective, when you experience it as a person, and that's when you start investing yourself, that's when you start to see the benefit of cumulative returns. Yeah, compound interest. What did they say? The fifth wonder of the world and it is indeed very very powerful when did you buy your very first share or make your very first investment with money you have earned i bought my first investment in 2004 just after i started working so my friends and i 
in the financial services industry decided to start what we call a club, an investment club. We used to call it Hot Orange. And we, believe it or not, took turns in researching different ETFs. And we would recommend whoever is responsible at the time. So we'd pick someone and take turns. And whoever had a turn would actually do research on the different ETFs, whether it's RESI, whether it's the top 40, New Gold. They would do some research, recommend it, and then we would vote on whether to invest in it or not. At the time, I contributed around 300 rands a month, though I do wish that I had contributed more. And I have to tell you that 19 years later, I still have that portfolio. I haven't used the money and I haven't liquidated it either. Hot Orange, a very, very interesting name for an investment club. Just Mm -hmm. tell us about the structure. How did you structure this club? Because sometimes they are issues with members trying to liquidate assets and uh, those clubs are not always as liquid as or to facilitate that. So how was it structured? And just tell us about the interaction between the parties. Were there lively debates or did you merely accept what some people said? How we structured it, unfortunately, it was in the name of one person, but I think everybody had access to their account to be able to buy the ETFs that we had voted on. So what we would do is the person that's responsible for researching the ETF would send the research and we would then debate it and discuss it over a glass of wine. So we'd meet, I think we met monthly because at the time we didn't have children, so we had more time. And uh, we would discuss it and debate it. And we had very rigid debates, you know. And I think that's when we realized that fees matter. The economic environment matters as well. And um, obviously returns matter as well. And I think it was a very, very good introduction to the investment world. How many members were there? It was less than 10 members at the time. I think around eight members. You just said you invested in predominantly index funds or exchange-traded funds. If I remember correctly, early 2000s, that is when the Satrix 40 launched, the pioneer of exchange-traded funds in South Africa. It is still around today, and you're the boss of that whole division. Tell us why exchange-traded funds, because they were not that popular back then. Absolutely. So it is actually quite a coincidence because um, we are celebrating 23 years of the first ETF that was launched. At the time, I didn't even know that I would end up being the CEO of an ETF business. But I think there was a lot of alignment from a low cost perspective a passive management perspective. Also, I think the ease of access to the ETF and also I think from a diversification perspective, I've always held the view that it's better to hold a basket of shares instead of holding one share. Because let's face it, I mean, I focus on my daily job and I just never had the time to do research on one specific company. Do you think it's a good way for young professionals to enter the investment world by forming an investment club? I think so. I think that it creates for debates. And I also think that it creates for more exposure into the industry. I also think that with what we launched in terms of the Citrix Now platform, where you can buy ETFs at a fraction of the cost. I think that also helps because then you don't even need to be in an investment club. I think at the time we didn't have what we call fractionalization and so we needed to pull together assets. But now you can buy an ETF at a fraction of the cost. That gives you access and also gives you an opportunity to start doing more research and learning about the different ETFs out there in the market. Because let's face it, when you do have money invested into something. That's when you start having vested interest. That's when you start learning about the different ETFs and taking interest. Have you ever bought individual shares as an investment? I actually have not bought any individual shares except for having some share options due to being an employee. But many young professionals who enter the job market, they have a bit of cash in their pocket. They would like to start an investment portfolio. Their very first 
inclination would be to buy the Vodacoms, the Anglos, the Naspasses, and Sunlum are one of the big blue chip companies and start there. Is that something you see that people do not consider all of the investment options before they actually start a portfolio? I agree with you. I think that many youngsters do that. And I think they make the mistake of doing that because most of them are not analysts and don't do a thorough investigation of these individual companies. I personally believe that investing in a basket of shares, such as an ETF, really, really helps from a risk management perspective. So from a diversification perspective, because you get diversified to the top 40 shares on the JSE. And there's other ETFs with similar exposures, whether you want exposure to financials or resources, but at least it's not one company. You're not exposed to one company. So you cover diversification perspective. I would also say that perhaps if the youngsters are very much interested in investing in one company, they could have a core satellite approach where they have a core ETF and then they have satellite companies that they believe would add value into their portfolio. And I think in that way, they're able to manage and mitigate risk by diversifying. Yeah, diversification is absolutely critical in any portfolio. But how do you think a young professional can value or evaluate a exchange traded fund? Because it's not like a share we can look at the financials, look at the comments of management to form an investment decision, because it is a basket of shares and you don't have that information. So how should they go about to choose the best one? What should they do? I was very fortunate to have had a history of having worked as an asset consultant for various pension funds. And in that, I learned that asset allocation is actually more important than stock selection. And so I would say that it would be very important to make an asset allocation decision, leave your money. So once you've chosen the different ETFs, then forget about it and ride the wave because you are a long-term investor in any case. I also think that if you do, for example, if you're not sure which ETFs to invest in, uh, maybe look at our access range. So with the access range, you've got the top 40, the MSCI, the balanced, and the money market. So those are the big asset classes that you could look at. And if you want to, you can add inflation-linked bonds or ILBs. So once you have a balanced allocation to different asset classes, then you're good to go. Yeah, I think that is sound advice. If you could go back to your 20-year-old self and give yourself advice, investment advice, what would that be? Sure. That's a, <laughs> that's a good question. I think that... Importantly, I think I could have saved more, saved more, contributed more. But, you know, I think as a firstborn child, also coming from a sort of previously disadvantaged background, it's very hard to save more because you have to buy your own first car, buy your own first property. So, but in hindsight, perhaps I could have added that extra 100 rands and from a a cumulative return perspective or compound interest perspective that would be worth much more today. Now, you are a professional investor. I would imagine you are well sorted with your pension fund contributions or retirement annuity structures. But do you have a discretionary portfolio on top of that after-tax money you invest yourself? I do. So I have three pots. I've got my pension fund portfolio, which I have never touched. And I'm grateful that I've done that because it's grown quite a lot and I don't want to even touch it going forward. I also have an investment portfolio and I also have from a savings perspective, because let's face it, there is a difference between investing and saving. And I think some people tend to use that or confuse the two and use the two 
interchangeably. So from a savings perspective, that's having access to money where perhaps you, maybe your geezer burst or you have a car accident, for example, that you have to have immediate access to cash. And from an investment perspective, that's the money that you invest into over the long term. And I think the reason why I separated the two is so that I don't get to touch my investment portfolio. And I think most importantly, also what I've done is um, through debit orders, I allocate, I make sure that I have a debit order that goes through my investment portfolio. And if there is an additional bonus at the end of the year or during the course of the year, that money goes into that investment portfolio as well. And what are you invested in? I'd say my portfolio, I'm invested in ETFs, of course. (laughs) Most of my portfolio has exposure to offshore assets. So I think I have 80% towards equities and around 60% towards offshore assets. So this is the MSCI world and also the MSCI emerging markets. And then I've got 20% into local equities, about 4% into equities, and then about 15% into inflation-linked bonds. And I think that was mainly because of the overrun from the good returns, and I need to rebalance that. I also have um, some share options, obviously, within the business. I don't know how many professional investors even can summarize the asset allocation as you've just done. So I would imagine you keep a very, very hawkish eye on the portfolio and the asset allocation, especially if there is a change in the investment world where asset allocation is absolutely critical, especially as we've seen with the rising interest rate cycle, not only in South Africa, but all over the world we've seen recently. Definitely. And and I think I've benefited quite a lot from holding income funds. Equally with the weak rent, my MSCI portfolio has done quite well. And I think it's a long term call. If I need to rebalance here and there, I will. So, for example, I think from a fixed income perspective, I'll probably rebalance that and uh, move it elsewhere. So how often do you change the portfolio? Because long-term investments, the philosophy or the theory behind it says, listen, buy and forget. But it doesn't seem like you are in that mode. Well, I mean, I don't change it often. I would say probably once a year and if it's necessary. But other than that, I'm actually quite happy with my allocation at the moment. And I'll probably leave it at that. Now for the question where I always elicit a giggle. What has been your absolute worst investment you have ever made? (laughs) I did solicit a giggle there. So, oh my gosh. So I must say, in addition to my hot orange investment club, I decided to, I knew I wasn't going to touch that portfolio. So I thought, let me invest myself. And unfortunately, I invested into a unit trust, a money market unit trust. And I must say that that portfolio grew even less than inflation for me. And I held on to that portfolio for quite some time. And I think as a youngster back then, I really should have invested that money into equities and I could have gotten a better return. And your very best investment you've ever made which investment are you the most proud of i have to say is increasing my allocation to the msci world etf the citrix msci world etf i have gotten very good returns from that portfolio and i also think that the rand weakness has also benefited my returns Fakile, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights. I believe there are many, many golden nuggets in there for young professionals to take to heart. Thank you so much for your time, Rake, and good luck to all the listeners. All the best and uh, happy investing. From your lips to God's ears. Fakile, thank you so much for your time. That was Fakile Mbokota. She's the CEO of Satrix. Show me the money. <laughs> That was the Money Web. Be a better investor podcast with Ray for Kneecap. Thanks for listening. Catch up and listen to all the Money Web podcasts on moneyweb.co.za or the app. 
MoneyWeb, your trusted source for business and investment insights.